at me. Tell me when, Tolga. Should I? Hi, everybody. This is Alex. I want to welcome you back on this fine Sunday night. I uh, hope you all had a good time. Watch football all day or whatever it is you do. Um, we are very lucky tonight. Ray Graylick has come back to talk to us. He was last here on uh, June 23rd, where he talked to us about PEMPRO. You know, PEMPRO is one of the programs he wrote, and um, uh, Pulse Guide is another one he wrote, and you guys probably use this stuff a lot. And uh, Ray's going to be here to tell us a little bit about one of the other programs that he's written, um, and it enables us to do amazing things with uh, particularly astrophysics mounts. And for those of you who don't have an astrophysics mount, that's okay. There's plenty in this show for you too, because the concepts behind what he's talking about, some of the some of the ideas about how you have to track your mounts performance and things like that, are uh, also part of. Um, it, it can be used in other software, so uh, there'll be plenty to say. Ray, you about ready? Ah, uh, yes, I am. Okay, you go ahead and take over. Okay. Let's see. You guys see it? Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, this talk is about APCC Pro. Um, it's making the most of your astrophysics mount. I'm going to go through the first part of this um, uh, uh, talk just very quickly, just to go over some of the features inside of APCC and then get to the, the stuff that I really want to talk about, which is unguided imaging. So um, the supported mount types are um, these listed here, they basically are all the mounts that astrophysics have made that uh, can support uh, uh, the GTO CP3, CP4, and CP5. And the C CP5 is um, is the um, uh, the controller for the Mach 2 mount, which is yet to be released. The required software, Windows 7 or later, ASCOM Platform 6.4 or later, and the um, AP V2 ASCOM driver. If you um, want to do imaging in any way or to uh, do the pointing correction, you need to also have some camera control software. And these are some of the software um, products that are, are supported. It's also nice to have a um, environmental input device to measure temperature and uh, humidity and, uh, and uh, air pressure. There's a couple of different devices. Um, APCC supports anything that that um, any device that supports the ASCOM observing conditions driver. The one I really like is the MG Box V2, and I got that from Tolga. So this is the link right here. And also the thumb is the older device. It's not quite as uh, good. It doesn't have uh, uh, the atmospheric pressure uh, sensor that the uh, MG Box V2 has. So I, I really like this one here. So on the setup tab, there's uh, a few things that uh, that uh, you need to do to set up uh, APCC. Um, first, you want to set up uh, the program operation, and you can either keep it on top, uh, show the emergency stop window, which is nice whenever you're slewing. If there's an errant slew for any reason, or if someone goes near the scope and you want to stop it, that that big flashing button will will cause it to to stop, allow you to stop the slew. And there's, um, you can see the, the mount type and firmware in case you ever have any problems and need to talk to astrophysics, you, you, can, you can relate to them what for, uh, version of firmware that you're using. And there's um, other tools that you can use like uh, a terminal to talk directly to the mount. Um, you can look at the logs and, um, and be the log director in case you need to have support in some way. And turn PC on or off. There's, um, a number of different programs that you can get to through APCC. There's a, um, a AP timer you know, utility. This, these come with the driver here, the AP timer, AP jog, the AP um, uh, right angle polar alignment uh, tool. There's of course PEMPRO and there's APPM, which is part of um, APCC Pro. The um, AP log zipper, if you have problems and that is, um, you know, need to have support in some way, you can use this tool to just uh, zip all your files and just give one file to to support, which is 
um, mostly um, Howard or, or George, and, and if um, needed, I, I can get involved too. And also there's a Horizons app, which allows you to um, that, like track objects that like Mars or um, any of the planets or comets or um, even satellites. The first thing you need to do is set up your initialization um, for the mount, and this is some of the settings here. Then there's, um, as I mentioned before, the environmental settings is a way to set up your either choice between uh, um, the ASCOM or the thumb device, and then you can test it out to make sure that it's working correctly. And there's some advanced settings here, which um, allow you to, when you when say that you're connecting to uh, APCC, it'll auto initialize the mount. Um, there's also auto shutdown, which will close down APCC afterwards. And um, there's a way to turn on or uh, disable logging um, and show the status window when starting. And or um, there's a way to prevent uh, errant recalls. So what that errant recalls are is is when you're um, you try to do uh, recal and you're more than five degrees away from where you're at, where the mount thinks it's at, then it'll, it will, won't will let you do it unless you turn this option off. By the way, if there's any questions, just let me know along the way. Okay. So um, one of the more important things is to do your site setup. And uh, if you haven't set up your site, APCC will I'll prompt you to set it all up. And making the connection, there's um, uh, a, uh, APCC supports both TCP and UDP connections to the mount. Um, it's uh, the controller has to have a CP4 or CP5, and there's a backup port option too. So in case the the connection fails, say it's a Wi-Fi connection, Wi-Fi fails, you can um, go to a backup connection. And there's independent timeouts for each um, each of the different connections. And of course, there's there's settings to auto connect um, and to both the ASCOM driver and APCC when APCC gets started. So that way it's all ready to set up. So you don't need to have, you don't need to be there to, to press any buttons to start APCC or connect to the mount or whatever. It'll just do it automatically, just as if you're talking right to the, to the ASCOM driver. Um, I know this looks kind of complicated, but um, APCC has a virtual port um, scheme. This allows um, a couple of different things to work uh, with it directly. It's like a virtual port router. So you could have up to four virtual COM ports. And so you could have um, your driver connect to one, like, let me put the highlight on here, laser pointer. So like um, right here, this, this shows where there's actually a connection occurring when it's a bright yellow and green like that. And so at this point, you'll know that there's a connection. This could be the ASCOM driver here. And you could have something like the sky connect on another one of these COM ports. And you can have define up to, to um, four of them. And the an APCC routes between them, uh, between that whatever device is out there to the mount and then back through the mount. And then it can even route it through TCP or, or UDP to get um, you know, the, the connection. And so, but the driver doesn't know what, what how it's connected and the, um, the sky doesn't know how it is connected directly to the mount. It just knows that it's that, that COM port is there. It looks like it is the mount. It's just transparent to everything. And I, by the way, when you do this, and uh, later I'm gonna get into the, to um, uh, the, the pointing model and all that, when you connect through the sky um, or any other planetarium program, it automatically gets all the functionality of the, the pointing model and the tracking rate correction independently and transparently. The devices don't even know what, um, that, there, that there actually is um, APCC in between it at all, just transparent to it. Another nice thing about this is that some, uh, there's, um, the mounts actually are, are capable of uh, two digit uh, precision in, um, RA in a single precision digit um, and um, decimal, I'm sorry, in DEC here, but um, some um, applications that are older, like Sky 6, really don't like to have that extra precision and they'll, they'll think it's um, not talking to them out. So you can select each of the com, um, virtual COM ports to have whatever number amount of precision that you want. And it also could prevent um, a sync to recal. Um, it'll actually, I'm sorry, it'll do a translation of sync to recal. Uh, to a recal so that um, there's a certain scenario where if you try to do a sync with the counterweight up, the mount could be lost at that point, and you really don't want to do that. So, and by the way, with the upcoming Mach 2, you won't be able to do that. The, the Mach 2, you can't actually lose its position. It's um, because of the way its encoders are, are um, designed into the mount. 
So there's um, APCC has a 3D view, so you can, let me see if I can bring this up here. So this is it right here. And you can just by, you see it moving around here, you can move around and adjust and you know, look at what way the, the mount is pointing. So you can look at it from south direction, um, north, top, west, east. You can also edit you know, the mount configuration. So if you want to make the telescope uh, length uh, shorter, larger, wider diameter, whatever, you can do all that. And you can even put it in a demo mode and stuff. And actually, I want to keep this open for later on for when I talk about the meridian limits, um, which is um, um, a reason why you have um, different meridian limits at different declination values. Sorry. Uh, Ray, before yes. we go any further, someone had a question. Does the site setup override the site setups in the AP ASCOM driver? Yes, it does. Um, if Well, actually, I should be clear about that. Whoever or whatever application initializes the mount is the one that gets it. Because once the mount is initialized with a latitude and longitude, neither the ASCOM driver nor APCC will override that. So once it's initialized, that's it. So, but you shouldn't worry too much about if there's a there's a discrepancy between the driver, and as long as it's close, it's not going to make much. It's not going to make any difference at all in terms of this. But the one that should be more accurate, or should, if you're going to have any one of the two accurate, it's going to be it should be APCC because if it's doing any kind of modeling and whatnot, it needs to know where it's pointing in the sky and the latitude and longitude help it figure out what. Um, uh, local sidereal time it's at and how high things should be in the sky in terms of altitude and um, you know ele elevation above the the, the um, horizon so but uh, uh, as much as a degree or so won't make much difference in you know latitude or longitude did that answer the question i hope anyway i'm gonna move on Okay, there's, um, I'm not sure how many people know this, but there's also a status window that you can bring up, which, um, and in fact, it's an alternative to the other window that you normally see, the main window. So when you have, this is the main window here. If you click on the status window, you'll get this window here. And, but you can turn on an option inside of um, the advanced settings here to, Show the status window when starting. So, but I'm I'm not going to do that. What it's going to do is just it's this window you won't see anymore. You'll see the status window instead, though. I'm going to cancel out of this and move this out of the way. And my presentation went away. Hold on a second here. My mouse went away now too. Okay. Um. So now I mentioned before the emergency stop. This is um, this is a, a window that comes up when you do a slew. I'm going to show you right here. See, I do a slew um, to right here. And you see this window here. If I click on this right here, it'll stop. It'll lock the slews out. This is this. You could use this in case if there's an emergency, like uh, say the 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 telescope is is maybe going to hit something or whatever, and you want to stop it, and it will lock it there and flash like this at you. You could turn it off if you want as well. And if you don't click it within a certain amount of time, it'll stop the tracking. After that, you see there's a countdown here. I'm going to stop it now and move this out of the way. And this is one of the nicest features, I think, of, um, of uh, APCC is this um, auto park, this safety park here. What happens is if, the, the say that you're connected to the mount, you're, you're doing your imaging and stuff, and something happens at night, your power, well, maybe power is not the best um, example, the computer crashes, or um, unlikely but possible APCC crashes, and you're, you're stuck, or, or maybe you're, you're, whatever application you're running is, um, is gets stuck or whatever, at that point, if there's if something crashes and the APCC cannot connect uh, to the mount anymore, it will automatically stop. There's a dead man timer that it talks to the mount with, and eventually that with the like we can see the countdown. Uh, it's about one minute or so. If it doesn't talk within one minute, 
it'll stop tracking on the mount. So keep your mount, protect your mount from, from continuing to track into um, the, the pier. Another um, new feature of the, of the the later versions of APCC is the, um, the mount homing. And uh, this really is um, a feature for those that don't unlock the clutches. If you don't unlock the clutches, you you can basically find your home position by after you set this up and set limits so that prevent the mount from doing any peer collisions. So this is mainly meant, um, meant for a remote setup of some sort. So um, move on here. The GoTo um, Recal tab allows you to convert from JNAS right. to J2000. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, this feature you just talked about, is that part of Pro or is that the standard? Which one, the homing or? The, yeah, homing. Yes, it's a part of uh, Pro and standard. Okay. And it, and it looks a little bit different if you have an encoder mount. An encoder mount has, it has a, it's an AE tab. It looks a little bit different. There's not that many of them out there, so I didn't put it up, but there's a, it's a, a different window. It looks sort of similar to this, it has the same features in it, but it's the encoder itself has, um, has different limits, some hardware limits on it, but it's um, very similar. But this is part of standard and pro. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this allows you to go to um, any, um, like convenient spots, you can even make this go to like say a you have a a, a light um, um, window set up someplace that you want to go for creating darks or whatever. I mean not darks, but uh, flats, so like a flat light you know setup. You could go to a certain um, uh, hour angle declination offset or alt as offset and is uh, suited to that coordinate. You can also do conversions between J two thousand and J now with this back and forth. And here you can set up your rates to do whatever rate you need. Say that um, you want to go at a, maybe a slower rate, maybe because it's loud, um, louder, louder than you want. Say you're in a, in a residential neighborhood and you're you're doing imaging all night. You don't want your mount maybe to go 1200x if your your neighbor's window is is um, 10 feet away. You might you can that's what I do. My neighbor's not too far away, so I use like a 300 or um, maybe 180. Um, X, you know, rate so it's real quiet when it moves. That won't be a problem, I guess, um, when the Mach 2 comes around. So the Mach 2 would be much quieter. So the horizon limits allows you to set a limit for when you um, the mount will stop tracking if it hits that limit. Um, there's been a couple of people that have asked about this um, that they've slewed into or below the horizon limit, and what happened is that they didn't um, it, it didn't stop tracking at that point. And the reason why is it's it's basically it doesn't prevent it's only when the mount hits that limit it's like an edge when it hits that limit um, of the horizon at whatever point it's at it's not going to uh, prevent you from slewing into that region if you do slew into it and um, it's below the, the horizon there it will um, it will time out on, I mean not time out it will uh, issue whatever the um, option is like right here is stop tracking. When it hits that, but you can most um, software applications might start tracking again. So a better option might be to park it or something. Uh, Meridian limits is a, another kind of complex feature here that um, allows the mount to be to go past the meridian either before the meridian or um, after the meridian, so that you're in the mount's in a counter rate or the in a counter rate up position. And it just allows you to image through the meridian without stopping. And the main reason for that is if you don't have a rotator on your um, on your camera, so you might lose your guide star if you have to rotate around or you have to search for another guide star. And so, but I guess if you're doing unguided imaging, it wouldn't matter much anyway. But um, there's other other options in here that help out with S SG Pro and and um, being able to set those limits appropriately. And the one interesting thing about this, and this is why I wanted to go back to that 3D view again, is that you it's different from most other mounts where you might be able to set one meridian delay. You can set a meridian delay that varies by the declination. And the reason why is I'm gonna bring up the 3D view again here. And then put it into demo mode again. And the window. Oh, it might be behind us. Uh, 
Well, <laughs> well, I'm on second here. Let's see if I can get out of this. I apologize. It's um, it's right here. See it come up there. there Maybe it is. we should explain a little bit about the astrophysics mounts. How uh, you know that they're they can go horizon to horizon in certain situations, and that's the reason why this applies. That's exactly why, right? So let's look at it no, here. I'm just saying that may, maybe I'll, some people may not know uh, that astrophysics mounts are capable of doing that. That's the reason why. Uh, right. That's exactly why. So if you see that the, the where it's at right now, I can actually put it into demo mode here. And um, if I move the declination axis to about where zero deck would be at, you could see that I can move the, well, that's a bad way to do it. It can go all the way from here and see there's no collision possible there. So it can go across that sky at at, um, at zero DAC there. Let's see if I look at it from the south angle here. So, so as I go, so it can go all the way across and there's no collision that occurs. Now, as declination changes though, say I go more up, um, let me go back to, yeah. See, there, there might be a collision right there. You can't really see that. I think it's, uh, see, it's, it would have hit right there. So depending on the declination, you can only go so far. So the point of the meridian limits uh, feature is that you can, you, you walk through the, the different declinations and you, can, you find how far the scope, your specific scope will go in each of those set, those um, um, uh, declination values right here. And you set up the values there too. Let me go from current slide here. So th this is actually a very cool feature. What you're saying is that you can set different meridian flip limits depending on the declination. That's right. It's exactly what happens. In it. And so it prevents the, the telescope from ever hitting the pier uh, in that case. So in, so at some places like near zero deck, you can, you know, the mount could swing around all the way through unless your cables are going to get all, um, you know, uh, uh, locked up. It would go around and around and around. But if you, as you get a little bit farther north or south, that the end of the telescope may hit into the pier at some point in time. And so you can't go quite as far. So this, this, um, this feature here allows you to define those limits for each of the declination values. And it leads you through by pressing the appropriate, um, you know, go to, there's like a, there's like a little procedure you go through. It's in the, in the, uh, manual here, but there's a deck increment here of five degrees. And so you go to that position and you press the button, then you start, you know, moving the mount, you know, um, you know, west or east, depending on which side you're at, to go see how far it goes before it just stops. And then it then you go on to the next position and it moves five degrees up and then it, it just maps it all out. So in, a, in the space of maybe, you know, half an hour, you have your, your both sides all mapped out how far you can go. This is just an example here. And if you really want to, you just you just want you can also just draw in here too. If you um just there's a feature in there, just edit it right by pressing the left left mouse button and drag to draw a limit. Is this it. in the standard program as well as the pro? Yes, this is in both. The only difference in the pro is that it has the pointing model and tracking rate model in it. That's the only improvements into it. There's one other feature which is coming soon, which may be of interest to people, um, but um, I'll get to that in a little bit. So pretty much everything you've told us so far comes in the standard package. That's true, standard and pro. And well, and everything in the standard also comes in the pro. That's but correct. You, ha you haven't gotten to the parts yet where you need to upgrade to pro to take advantage of. That's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the last thing that um, last feature here um, on the on the on the tabs is the GPS feature, which allows you to set up a new new mount um, uh, position or new new site position. So basically, like I have the MG Box V2 here, but I didn't let it connect. So, but once if it did connect, you can create a new site Im immediately from that and just save it. So it's just it's a convenience feature. So now we get into the pointing model.
So this is now in the APCC Pro only. So this tab doesn't exist on the standard, it just um, exists on, on the Pro. So there's two main features that you can turn off individually in here. One is the pointing and one is the uh, tracking rate correction. And you can see the status right here. The, the, at any point in time when you're pointing someplace, it'll tell you how, how much error it thinks that there is between where the mount is pointing and what it actually is looking at in the sky. And so you can see that in my case, there's 26 minutes of deck error and about three um, minutes, that's arc minutes, and this is three minutes, three and a half minutes of um, RA. And also it shows me this, the, um, the uh, seconds per hour in tracking rate and arc seconds per hour in deck. Now I purposely, what I did here is I purposely um, um, pushed the polar alignment off a little bit, as you can see right here. These numbers right here show the, the polar alignment error in arc seconds. So you can see that there's in the two independent models that um, are there for east and west, and you can see that they pretty much agree pretty uh, pretty well between the two. So there's um, about half a degree almost of um, of azimuth error, and probably about a quarter degree in polar um, elevation error. And despite these, though, I can get um, unguided images easily in 10 minute range with 1.7 arc seconds per pixel, and you won't be able to tell any any um, um, elongation in the star in that. You start getting to 20 to 30 minutes, you can at that point. But that, at that, that, that level, there's not. And so from here, the negative value, if you're in the, um, if you're in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, let's see, I'm gonna make sure I get it right. I should actually put it in here. If, it, uh, if it's negative, that means you need to adjust clockwise or east. So in other words, um, if you're looking on top of the mount, looking north, you want to move it east. So in my case, I'm, I'm pointing a little bit. Um, I'm talking about the east numbers here, not the west. The west is the negative of the east in this particular case here. Um, so I would want to move it counterclockwise about um, um, about a, oh, I, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong one here. The azimuth here, uh, about a quarter, I'm sorry, half a degree or so. And Let's see, for the elevation, the elevation, it's negative. It's, um, you have to lower the axis. That's what it means right there. It's a negative number. Just wanted to make sure I had, it, I had the notes here for it. So there is a little bit of discrepancy between the tube flexure and uh, the, the flex cantilever axis between the two sides. It might be that I have some cables that are a little bit um, uh, pulling on one side more than the other side but uh, everything else pretty much is pretty close to each other. So that's a good, that's a good sign there. Any questions on this? Oh, should... um, yeah. I'm sorry, am I stepping on somebody? No, that was, I was gonna say one thing, but go ahead. Um, I, just, I just wanted to point out for those of you who aren't uh, real familiar with what's happening here in pointing model, um, all these characters that they're talking about, offset error, offset error, declination, non-perpendicularity, and all those other things, those are the things that you're trying to figure out when you first do your celestial, while you're, you're pointing, and then your first star in the pointing just tells where the telescope is pointed. But your second, third, fourth, and subsequent stars are working mathematically to figure out where all these different errors are when you're building your mount. Um, and this concept of a pointing model is used in a lot of places, not just in something like APCC. That's all. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Something maybe not so obvious is that you see right here, although this is just a, um, a simulator right here, uh, APCC can take um, the temperature and pressure. And um, if, you, if you hover over the top of them, you, it'll actually just um, display more information like it, the values in Fahrenheit and, and whatnot. So there's, there's extra in information there too. Ray, I have, I have a question. Uh, it, might, it might be a little bit too advanced and you, you may want to get into that later. If, and if it's so, please tell me. Uh, I understand the advantage of building East and West models. I, I really do. That's a, actually, I see that as a feature. But what do you do when you don't flip? Like if you do, if you use that feature of astrophysics going horizon to horizon and you don't flip, 
which model do you use? Do you use the East model, for instance? Um, if you don't flip, you would only use the side that you built the model for. So you can independently build. You don't have to build both sides if you don't want to. I'll, I'll get into the APPM, which is the Point Model Builder, and um, and how you can select different um, uh, ranges of points if you want. But you say that you know you're always going to do east side, the east side of the um, the meridian, for instance. This is that's what those are. They're not pure side. It's the east side of the mount. So right here, it's east side. Um, you know, and west is west, the actual west side, you know, where the sun sets. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm, I'm actually talking about you, you will be on the west side, but you'll be counterweights up on the west side. Right. When you do it, there's actually a, a two more models that get built when it's counterweight up because there is um, there at that point in time, the model changes a bit when they're the when the um, the counterweights are up. It's another, it's like a transition between the two models. So there's actually four models. I didn't want to complicate things by going into that, but so there's there's actually- Yeah, okay, so models. that's what I thought. It, right, that's the reason why I said it might be. Right, right. So it is, yeah, so you're right. Okay, I see what you're saying, what you're getting to. You're actually pointing to that side, but you're counterweight up. And so which model would you use? You're, it's actually a different model in that case there. But there is sort of okay, a transition, so It's because kind of, there's usually not as many points there. So there's a little bit of a transition. It's kind of a tricky uh, set of um, uh, transition from that model to, you know, the counter counterweight down model. Okay. Yeah, let's skip over that. I think it's going to get too complicated. Okay, it's fine. So in the tracking rate correction, there's um, another feature here, which you can use. Say that you're, um, yeah, there's, like, there's, there's something I found out that not only does temperature affect the refraction coefficient, but it also affects the stiffness of um, the, um, the, the the telescope itself. So even if you have a model that you built up and it's, it's a really good model, accurate model, if the temperature shifts by five or 10 degrees, the stiffness in the the, the metals and plastics and everything in your, your uh, telescope change enough so that the bending characteristics um, are, 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 are slightly different. Even, well, even, you know, you notice that even with uh, temperature changes, the, the OTA itself changes its size. The length of the OTA changes. If it gets colder, it's going to be actually be shorter. That changes the focus point on it. It actually ch changes the balance. It changes the stiffness. So any model that, that you have is going to be slightly wrong once the temperature is different from wherever you measured those points at. So one of the ways that I was, um, that you can use to, um, I, be, I was using this is to use the tracking weight uh, uh, tweaking feature, which allows you to offset a little bit to see which way it goes to see if it, it experimentally, it works the way it's supposed to. And so you can adjust the rates to see if it matches some. Um, there's other ways, there's ways of finding out how well you're tracking. You can do a plate solve and look at the coordinates and then plate solve another 10 minutes later, look at coordinates again, and you know see what the delta is between the two. But even plate solving, I find I, I can do five or six plate solves in a row and you know right, and I know that the scope hasn't moved very much and the values that are returned differ by you know, uh, maybe a half arc second or so, maybe sometimes more. I found out that um, that it's really, really important to have as many stars as you can. So if you, one of the options inside of APPM, you're gonna get to that in a little bit, is to do a one quarter um, size um, of your sensor, or half size or a full size. I found that if you do the full size of the image with more stars in it, that you get a more accurate and more consistent result than if you do less stars. So the more stars you can get, the, the better the, the um, resolution is going to be, the better the accuracy is going to be on your plate solve, and the more likely it's going to result in a good you know, um, a pointing model or, or an accurate pointing model. So um, it's, it's really important to, to keep that in mind. The only caveat to that is that some of the plate solvers, like Pinpoint, if you, there are certain areas of the sky, like near the Milky Way, where it may have too many stars. So if that happens, and you, you try to plate solve, it says there's too many stars, sorry, can't do the plate solve. Then you may have to, to um, walk it down to a quarter or, or you know half um, of the image just to get the plate solves to work if you're gonna, you're in that area of the sky. So one of the features I'd like to put in, in, um, in the future is to take the full frame and then, then if it fails from pinpoint in particular, then to just use the center portion of that same image to um, actually do the, the the plate solve and that solves the problem. Another way to do it is to lower your um, 
your uh, magnitude, deepest magnitude. So there's not as many stars that are found. So those, those are two things there. And um, but even that, even if you use full full frame, um, all the stars I could get in that there was like literally hundreds, many hundreds of stars in there. I could get you know a bunch of plate solves one by one, and it would be off by a little bit one way or another. If you use depending which um, catalog you use, it it differs depending on which plate solver you use. It's different. So there's a variance of one or two arc seconds between all the plate solvers. And um, so when you have all those errors put into there, you don't really know for sure how how accurate or how accurate your model really is. You can't really get more than one or two arc seconds, I think, accuracy um, you know, from any one particular point. All sky, though, it should average out, I think. You know, right. So I haven't done any studies on that yet. Right. Um... Yes. You earlier a slide went by um, talking about which plate solve, so solvers are supported in this particular program. Um, oh, can you tell us? Again? I didn't get to that. I, oh yeah, I didn't get to that one yet. Actually, these are the three right here that are um, supported. There are other ones that we're considering too. So there's Pinpoint, there's SkyX, and there's Plate Solve Two, which is um, in um, SG Pro, Sequence Generator Pro. I think Sequence Generator Pro may, su may support some other ones too. So I think also with pinpoint you can do, um, you can do um, an online plate solve to wherever um, imaging, um, you know, a resource that you have that's online. It doesn't have to be, you know, the the more the more popular ones. It could be anyone. It could even be into your own computer. You can install the uh, catalog on your computer. So, but um, does that answer okay. your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. I I thought you had mentioned it really quickly in passing uh, at the yeah. very end. But okay. I did. I was going to get back to it. I okay. just had got to it yet. So, um, but uh, the the so the plate solving anyway is is an important uh, thing to consider when when trying to do any type of mapping run, whether it's an astrophysics mount or a uh, you know you're using the SkyX or you're using um, any of the other um, um, programs around or other mounts. So, Ray, Ray, there's a question about plate solving coming up in the. Uh in the thread here, they're asking why worry about uh, doing all this if you can just plate solve. Oh, you mean why why do that? Why, because why, why, why would worry you about when you can just plate solve is the question. Well, you could just do that, but then you're wasting time. So just imagine this that you know, sure it's only a few minutes or so that you you plate solve, then you move them out, and then you 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 plate solve again, and maybe off a little bit, then you do it a second a second time. You've wasted time there that you could be imaging. That's the number one thing. You want to be dead on if you can, and, and also like if you're if you're doing unguided, it's really important that you are able to go to say you're just doing like um, looking for supernova or something like that. You're just uh, or, or or comets or wherever, and you're just going to go between a bunch of different locations and whatnot. You don't have time to set up and and uh, you know do plate solves and you know adjust for everything like that. You just want to be make sure that whatever your target is is um, is centered well, and um, you know and and in, in the first time. So that's that's one reason. The second reason is that with the tracking rate model, your guiding is going to be a lot smoother. You're not going to be um, adjusting the, or you're not going to be having to um, have auto guider moves as much. Your RMS is going to be lower. And recently, there was somebody that had um, pointed out that they didn't notice any difference between PEC on and PEC off. And I, I asked them for their logs, and uh, the logs showed that there was a, a large amount of drift in, in RA. In that particular case, there. So what was happening is that it overshadowed the the RA or the periodic error. So even with the periodic error corrected, which it did do, which was corrected with the PEC on, there still was a bunch of moves caused by the drift. So, but if you eliminate the drift, your RMS is going to go down because your 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 auto guider is going to keep recentering that thing that keeps moving off the center. So your your images are going to be a little bit sharper. So it's it's not just the pointing. The pointing by itself is is one thing. It just saves a little bit of time. But the real advantage comes when you can get that tracking rate much closer to to zero drift. So even if you don't do unguided, if you you can get that drift, you eliminate whatever drift drift you have inherent in your system down to almost zero. Your auto guider is just making small moves rather than this this consistent move, you know, a larger move. And your, your your image is already damaged by that time because it's already got a little bit of a it might be a tiny streak, but it is a streak in there. 
So that, that's the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the question is, how do you create these models and how much time does it take to do this? Um, well, it you could do you could start making a model probably right around twilight or so or or you know sunset or after sunset. Um, I didn't mean twilight. <laughs> right after sunset, and at that point, it takes about uh, two. It, you can actually do about two to three points per minute. So to do a hundred points, maybe thirty to thirty-five minutes or so it takes to do it, and um, so. This is just all it's going to do here. APPM is the one that's just a point mapper. All it's going to do is just going to go through the sky and 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 do those plate solves across all those different points in the sky before it gets finally uh, all the way dark. If you're if you're in a in a mobile imaging setup, there's a new feature though that I've been working on for um, APCC Pro, which actually takes uh, the auto guider movements and, and looks at them. So that um, say that you you don't have a model, you go to a certain point in the sky and you start imaging there and you have an auto guider on it. It starts looking at the trend for the auto guider and starts adjusting the, the tracking rate of the mount to match it so that your your tracking rate eventually, your guiding is going to get better and better and better because the tracking rate is going to start matching the the um, the drift that it that it's uh, seen from the auto guider moves. So an auto guider moves can either be from you know just in like an ST4 or it can be from a um, just like like PhD2 or whatever whatever your auto guiding program is maximum PhD2 whatever and so the, that drift will get automatically adjusted and, and it, it's smart enough to know that if it moves to a new RA deck to start over again and you know to to calculate that so then you don't really have to build a model to do that but you will get improved guiding just after a short period of time. Now, if you jump around to a bunch of objects, then it's probably not going to help you much. In that case, then maybe a pointing model would be better. But, but um, anyway. So what um, you could, there's a lot of different settings inside of APPM to to um, you know pick the the types of um, of um, points that you want to select. So the, you normally just define the um, the camera settings, full frame or sub frame, the binning, the exposure time. And I, like I said earlier, I think that full frame is the best choice. I would do one X binning and this, and maybe do five seconds or so of exposure. That's all you really need. And um, you define your plate solve settings, which are, you know, it's depending on which um, particular uh, plate solving um, uh, application you're using. And then just uh, define a number of points. I think for like a, a, a if you're going to set up an, um, like, uh, local setting someplace, you know, mobile setting, then maybe like 30 or 40 points is all you need. And you can really be done with that in about 15 minutes or less. That's all it takes then in your, your setup. You may not get the great the greatest accuracy with um, uh, if there's anything that's flexing in your scope, like maybe if, especially if you have a reflector, if you have a refractor, you'll get pretty good results with that. Um, so anyway, so as I as I said before, there's three different um, plate solving programs that we support right now in APPM. It's uh, Pinpoint, SkyX, and Plate Solve 2, which is actually just SD Pro. And so you can see some of the options you have here, you know, setting the, the image scale and whatnot, and catalogs and whatnot. So um, after you after you created a model and got all you got all the points, you want to actually do a couple things and. One of them is to to look at your residuals to see if there's anything that's unusual, and if there's any unusual patterns, you might want to investigate to see if there's anything that's tugging or or you see any errant points. There's there's a few things that that people may not be aware of that you can do inside of um, app inside of APCC. One of them is that this um, area here you can exclude points that are outside of a certain range here. So if there there's um, um, uh, outliers or whatever, you can get rid of those points to improve your model. And then when you get the model down to this kind of level here, you can get you can expect really good pointing accuracy throughout the whole sky. And if you need to investigate any particular areas, you can go down and look at all the details. Everything is all um, all shown here, and every one of the there's a bunch of columns here that you can look at to to see the errors. There's also right here I'm showing you an error scatter plot. There's also sometimes it's useful to there's um other X Y type graphs. There's a there's a drop down list here. Let me see if I can bring that up here. Uh, 
Okay, pointing model. <clears throat> so this is that this is that same pointing model, and I go here. I can look at. I can compare the mount hour angle. And I can look at the corrected RA error. I can look at the uncorrected RA error. See what it looked like here. So you can see the numbers here, like how much error that it was correcting. So it was beforehand. It was like some of these were almost 2,000 arc seconds, but after correction, now it's um. It's down into the you know negative 25 to 20 range or so in error. But it also looks like there's a little bit of a pattern here that maybe there's a possibility of um of doing a little bit more with the modeling. Here it looks a little bit more random. I'm not sure I can do much with the West model here. So there's other um experimental features I'm working on trying to improve the model, and those will probably come out in the, in the next point release of um APCC. So any questions on that? Okay. So, so now the unguided imaging accuracy. This is the um, I've already talked about some of these things, and the the, the um, precision of your pointing is going to be dependent upon a, a number of things: the number of data points that you have, your the pointing repeatability of the telescope. Um, so this is this is an important thing that some people don't. Um, I don't think understand very, very uh, well. You need to have a very rigid telescope because if the telescope has a certain amount of randomness in it, then the pointing model is not going to be able to work very well. It's because it's going to get points that are going to be different every time that you you run the model or you try to run a, a set. And you can actually test that with um, with APPM. It has a feature in it. Let me bring it over here. It has. You can do this right here. Model 5X in park. So what this will do is that you can either do this in a verify, which means with a model that's already created to see how how good it is and repeat it, you know, repeat it X number of times after you had a model, or even before you had a model with this option off. And so it'll do it five times and it'll it'll present data to you of how good of um, repeatability your mount is. So you'll be able to um, determine if it there's a little bit of randomness in some part of the sky and then be able to go and figure out if um, there's something in that part like a cable or something like that it's maybe tugging and causing some uh, pointing errors and then if, if there's pointing errors then the tracking rate correction is not going to be right because it's the data it's um, getting is garbage so garbage in garbage out for your tracking rate so one other thing i've noticed and i think i mentioned this before is that the temperature um, affects not only refraction but mechanical stiffness in the in the mount. So as the temperature drops, the 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 metals and plastics inside of the telescope become stiffer, and so the the coefficients and terms that are used to calculate the pointing model change. So there the accuracy in pointing is off by just a tiny amount, and the tracking rate is off just by a tiny amount. But because the telescope is in, in the arc second range of um, you know imaging capability, it can it will detect that. It's very good at detecting that. If you want to have a good uh, way of detecting how well your your um, mount is um, is tracking, you know if you you have a mount that it's even better than visually is if you have either you can either use PEMPRO for this or use PHD two and turn your auto guiding off, and then just tr just point it to some place in the sky, and then just see how how uh, flat that that um, that uh, curve is going to be or the data is going to be. If it's pretty darn flat, then yes, it's tracking, but it's going to be able, you're going to be able to see more difference in that than you'll ever see. You'll see that you'll see um, drift before you'll see it in the image itself, in an image. So you'll be able to see like in, in a minute or two if that drift is off by, but if you took a minute image of the stars, it will look pretty darn round. So that's that's a good way to tell how much drift there is. And it's 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 way more sensitive than actually a visual image. So. And um, I think I, I was going to just show some some images I've taken with my. This is at one point seven. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to to mention. A lot of times I see people post um, on cloudy nights and other place images, and they're gonna they take a full frame image, and um, they they um, post it there, and it's basically not the same resolution it's not to one to one ratio what their what their uh the scale was when they were imaging so you really can't tell if there's any um any drift inside of that image 
So really the only way to really do this, if they actually show it one-to-one, -one, you know, the actual size, you know, full scale, or if they, they have a FITS image that um, you can take a look at and, and see what the, the data looks like. So I have, um, lately I've been playing around with, um, uh, with a new version of APCC Pro with um, some, with what's called a declination arc feature in it. So what it does is it, um, the, the way that APCC collects data, it, it collects it along the same declination arc path and moves another declination and whatnot. And the, um, there's a slight difference in terms of the, the um, tracking rate correction that it um, can get from that, just slightly better, I think, than all sky, because all sky is like anything there could be, um, if there's one errant data point, it contributes to it. It's like an, like a um, one of the uh, bad point actually c contributes to making you know the good data um, um, bad. So by having these arcs there, and as long as the arc doesn't have any bad data in it, you can get better accuracy on that. So I'm going to find my there it is my images here. I can just basically point at any object I want and. So here's, this is a, some of these are, most of these are 10 minute images. And so there's one, there's 72.93. This one was the helix. It was the very bad part of my sky. I, I'm in San Jose. There's you know, a million plus people here. I don't, I didn't use any filters on this. That's why I, I really need to get as a, maybe an H alpha filter so I could do longer exposures, but this is pretty low. This was actually outside of my, my um, region of um, of measurement for um, pointing and tracking rate correction. So even though it was outside of it, still is easily doing, you know, ten minutes. It's a little bit further north here. So again, pretty good. May even show two X here. Stars are pretty round in the center. If you go to the edges of this, there the you know the 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 field isn't perfectly flat. You'll see some edges you know from the it has a flat field converter and this is a traveler and it's 1.7 arc seconds per pixel but it's not the it's not uh drift you're seeing here it's just that it's not perfectly the distance isn't perfectly um correct whoops between the sensor and the uh flat field corrector so there's a little bit of unflat but in the center of the image though it's uh pretty darn round let me do a here's this here's a um this is M74 again, really bad, but uh, light pollution, but pretty good stars there. And unguided. Well, I can I can, um, I can I can vouch for APCC, and uh, I have an 1100 mount uh, with a 14 inch plane wave on it, which runs on 0.55 arc second per pixel uh, scale, and with APCC I can do five minute exposures. I I didn't try to go further, but five minutes. That's pretty good. I could do. But that 0.5 arc seconds, you know, 0.55. That's pretty amazing. Excellent, excellent. It's good to hear. And there are other people that have um, have um, uh, pointed out there that they've done uh, pretty long imaging. I think like 20, 30 minutes or so. I think uh, Bill Long has done has told me a few times a few images that he's done, and there's others too. I don't remember all their names. Um, once you get up to about 30 minutes or so, so this is this is 10 minutes here. This is on a different night. Last night I was testing out and here's what 30 minutes looks like. You can actually see at this point, it's starting to break down the model. This is with a, um, a 98 point model, a little bit after after 30 minutes. But you know, but you you go out to this point right here, you won't notice it very well. It looks pretty good at that image scale, which is what you normally see at cloudy nights. But when you actually look at the real image scale and you go up to two x like this, and you see a little bit of tracking here. But this is thirty minutes. I think with a little bit more tweaking on it, and um, an adjustment for those temperature changes, which I was uh, I was mentioning earlier. Um, I think that I could correct uh, the, the the remaining residual error here, provided there's not something else that's causing. You know, some of the changes Ray, this, Eric, you should be able to plot the eccentricity of the stars versus time of exposure with the unguided image. You should be able, yes, absolutely. 
So, but one one other way to do it, though, like I said, is to just take PEMPRO and or, or PHD2, turn off guiding, and just capture it. You'll be able to see the drift way, way sooner than you would be able to see through an image like this. I know that there's a little bit of drift in there. It varies from night to night, and it varies by temperature. And so that's part of what I'm modeling, that, that the 3D model of both the uh, multiple sets of data at taking at different temperatures. Every one of the data points that gets collected has a temperature point associated with it. And across different nights, I can build up a database that shows the um, the differences that occur as the, the telescope is a little bit stiffer when it's when it's colder or a little bit less, a little bit more flexible when it's when it's warmer, and to map those changes to make a better model out of it. So it'll be the first one of its type. I don't think there's anything. I don't think anybody else has a model that's that's done that yet. Um, at least I'm not aware of it. Maybe there is, but maybe in a professional level. But um, they have this uh, 3D model in terms of um, the third dimension being temperature is um, is what um, I'm striving for in the next version of APCC. And probably other people may do the same thing too, other vendors, if it works. Like I hope it will. Any questions? Yeah, we got several of them. Um, there, one's coming in from Rumble Talk from um, from Thomas, uh, and another. Anyway, let's say that we're just an average guy, and we're trying to set up in our backyard, um, or on our, you know, on the, and we're out camping or something like that. Um, do I need APCC? Um, well, it depends what you're doing and what image scale you're, you're uh, running at, if you, how much sky you have uh, uh, visible. If you had, um, like I said, you could set up everything and do about 30 minutes of, um, of modeling beforehand. And especially if you're going to keep the mount set up for several nights, it might make sense to even do longer um, modeling. But um, it, if, the, if the data is fresh, then the data, you know, the temperatures are fresh and whatever, it's not changing a whole lot between night to night, that you're going to get better results, I think, in that case. You can get away with 20 or 30 points easily, and it'll take you 15 minutes to do that. So you just need to be roughly polar aligned. And okay. So um, I've got some friends that um, are very proud of the fact that they've done a 300 point um, T point model mm -hmm. and uh, stuff like that. And I fine. Well, congratulations on your T point model. Um, and I imagine this is somewhat analogous to that kind of a thing. Um, it just seems to me that um, if I'm going to be changing around after three or four days that I've spent a lot of time there. So somebody told me, well, you know, you don't have to do those 300 points every night. You do the 300 points every now and then, but then every night when you first set up you do 15 or 20 points and that resets the model to where you are etc cetera, etc cetera. is there such a thing in apcc and or is there even such a thing in the sky i don't do t points so um maybe i'm even wrong there in understanding what they were saying no i i have heard i, I know i i've used uh, t point before and yes there is they recommend um doing at least six points but sometimes more to to um sink into the model um, I don't think that that's necessary. I've been getting really good results just by doing a plate solve. And um, what you can do is when you do that plate solve, as long as the time is accurate, you know where the model should be at that point. And there's like an inverse of the model. And so you take you know, the inverse of the model. That, even though you picked the mount up and the scope and turned everything around. And oh, no, no, that, that you can't do that then. You okay. have to, no. Okay, yeah. But so I'm asking the question on behalf of the those of us that, drag our mounts around someplace not on uh, is APCC an observatory tool or well uh, for I think APCC Pro might be in that case more of an observatory tool and because that in that case you would want to, there's no reason why you shouldn't spend 30 minutes setting up a model once and then every every uh, couple of months or so maybe set up another um, um, you know uh, an updated model if the temperature changes quite a bit or and you can save you can save different um, um, settings basically for it. So you can have one or more different settings based on the telescope that you're using. So and, and it'll be very close if you be able to switch between and just keep the balance point about the same for for each setup. And 
um, you know, the focus is going to be all the same. So you can save settings for one type of telescope. And if you're going to switch telescopes out, you can save settings for another type of telescope. And I've talked about pointing models, including in the settings too. So um, you'd have to run separate pointing models for each case. One thing I thought about doing is, is um, having a, a switchable pointing model. So if you have two scopes, one model and another one, that you could switch between the two models, depending on which scope you're using. And, but um, just haven't had the time to look at that. Thing is a partial model though. James was asking if, um, he, you know, he knows he's only going to be imaging up by the bubble nebula. Can he just pointing model up there? Yes, you can, yes. Okay. It, yeah, there's, there's different ways inside of, let me bring up APPM here. And mm -hmm. you can see right here in the measurement points, if I open up the show points region, I can say I only want to create um, east points, for instance. Okay, then I have different controls on spacing on it, how much spacing I want, um, the minimum altitude that I want. I can set it higher or lower. I could set the hour angle that I want. So the hour angle, you really it doesn't have a, a thing that's changing there, a line that's changing, but it can change the hour angle there. I can change the minimum, you know, angle for or the minimum, minimum south deck, minimum, maximum north deck. So you could you could select ranges there to make whatever it is that you want, and if that isn't good enough, you can actually even create your custom range of points with that. You can you can actually import it in, import a custom mapping points, and it's very simple um, format. It's explained in the help file. Since if I know that I've got a horizon, if I got a row of trees over on the west side of my house, I could just go with what you're you're, you're des designating there. Just do the east side. Right, right. So what I have right here too is see the this right here is the it looks about you really can't tell about a circle, but it's actually my horizon here. So if I go into APCC and edit that horizon there a little bit. Oops. Well, I'm gonna edit first, hold on a second here. So let's, let me edit this right here. So I've got something right here. That's, that's a tree there. I just changed it real quickly here and make sure I save that. And then you, what you have to do here is you have to refresh meridian limits. I hope I saved it right. Oh, I didn't save it. Darn it. Okay, let me do that again. So make this here save as. No, I, did. I really didn't want to do that. So, okay, maybe. Okay. And then now settings. Okay, so now you see this limit here. So now if I turn that on, um, the limits right here, use APCC limits here, actually shouldn't create a point there. Rise and limits. Okay, I just had to turn it on and off. And so now anything within that limit there. So if I move this down here, it won't do anything. So I may change the minimum altitude to something below it. It'll only do it in the horizon here, your range right here. So if I move it up, so there's a lot of different ways that you can you can eliminate points, and then even when this, you can make it denser if you wanted to um, by doing this. You know, more points that you want to do just that area here, and the same thing with the right section. So you can make a lot of points in that area. Those blocks right there are showing the counterweight up positions for that particular scenario. And if you're unsure about how things are ordered, you can do something like this which shows the order of points and you can even animate it if you want. It'll show you what order you want to go to. So there's a lot of little things like that that are built into it to, you know, show you how how things are going to proceed. Right, right. I have a question. Sure. Um, what is the purpose of that first point where it goes to the zenith on the east side? This point right here is just to establish a, a common point that's not affected much by refraction. So it's pointing almost straight up in the sky. So it's very little refraction there. It's just to set it to uh, uh, to set the initial point of where everything else is going to be referenced off of. That's all it is. is. Is that a problem if that one fails? If what fails? If that one fails, like the, imagine oh. if that it, the, the if, plate solve fails on that one. Is that a problem? Should should we restart the model? Yeah, I think so. It's probably it, it's it's 
undetermined what will happen after that. I think what's going to happen is it's going to take the second point that it finds, which will be, you know, usually in the southern part, most part. But what will happen is that later on, if you, well, actually, it, it probably would work. It just no matter how, it's going to be different offsets. It's going to be offset from maybe this point right here. Can you see my mouse right there? From whatever the first point is that it's going to go to after this point. Typically, if, if it has, you know, a, a failed or whatever, usually uh, I'll, I'll redo it. And usually that's because maybe there was a cloud or something like there that I didn't realize was there. And, um, you know, then just redid it later on or another time. But yes, it's better to make sure that that point um, solves. Okay. Because what it does after that, after it does that first point, then it does another plate solve on it. After it sinks to it, it goes back and, and does it one more time to make sure it's right at that point. That, that becomes the very first point for it. And what it's trying to do is get the correct, accurate uh, hour angle, you know, in, in declination in, in um, RA from, from our actual hour angle from the meridian at that point. So, because it'll change a little bit by depending on how long it takes to slew there. Any other questions? Uh, Ray, uh, cone error, does the app deal with cone error? Yes, it does. Yeah, that's part of the, um, the, um, couple different there's the non-perpendicularity of the ha and deck and and this one right here these two right here deal with that so it looks like I, I know i do have a little bit of a tilt in mind it's because there's a plate that's tilting up a little bit off the axis of um, the deck and so that's what that number is there excellent Oh, is there a recommendation of how dense your grid should be with various image scales? If it's, um, there's not a recommendation, but the greater the image scale is, the, in order to lower numerically, the more I would put into it. So again, it doesn't take that long to do this. You, you do it on a moon moonlit night or something, then you know you're, you're set up for a while, and um, it's it's like two to three points per per um, minute at least. It really depends on how fast the plate solves happen. And I've made um, some improvements in the more recent versions to make sure the plate solves are pretty darn quick. There's also, um, I've been thinking about making it completely asynchronous to it. So what we'll do is just slew, take a picture, slew, take a picture, and then there'll be a separate pipeline for processing those images afterwards. So just to be as, as fast as it possibly can. It'll be interesting. I'm, I'm, I have a, a Mach 2 on order, and I want to see that one, that uh, mount can move faster, so faster, to see how fast it could actually get through, you know, X number of points. So, the biggest models I've um, done. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I want to. I want to make it interesting and disagree with you a little bit on something. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, I. Because you said that APCC Pro is more for permanent installations, and uh, I'm I'm gonna push you on that a little bit. Okay. And well, what I'm, I'm gonna saying... say, go ahead. And what I'm gonna say is that you can start modeling way before uh, tw astronomical twilight. So you can finish your model before it's time to image. I agree. I agree, hundred percent. I just didn't want to feel like I was pushing anybody into it. Um, you know, All right, right okay. <laughs> I, I, the, the, the thing is that also there's a, that other feature I told you about, which is um, you know, just using the auto guider. Um, and, and that will adjust the rate. That might be useful too. Even, even though it's going to be a pro feature rather than just a standard feature, um, it, will, it will still adjust the tracking rate to match whatever the auto guider is telling it is the drift. And it'll have to, it'll take a few points before doing it. It doesn't want to just just take the first one and just say oh the drift because if, it, if if there's like a lot of uh, uh, bad seeing that happens, the drift could be set to something that's pretty bad or pretty wrong. Well, you know well, you know what happens when you look at at um, at the declination axis, right? When you're when you're doing um, polar alignment, there's sometimes some drift up and down, and those are slow you know tube currents, you know possibly going wafting through the the field of view and it's it's causing a little bit of a, 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 a refraction on the, the the position of the stars and so that's that's what's happening there if you ever look at the moon you know at you know at um, low power or, or medium power you'll see that you you can see like the wavy surface of the moon and it's like looking at um 
like with binoculars down a hot road, you know, it's, you see the waviness of the road there. You see the waviness of the moon. So it has to average it over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that was it. I just, I just wanted okay. to. All right. I just wanted to say that you could use the Pro as a. Uh, I, I think it had. There's a benefit of using the APCC Pro for uh, even for uh, portable uh, use. That's I think all I so want. Too. I, I would do it if I were going to go someplace. I would definitely want to do that because. Yes, yeah, so that's just, all I wanted to say. Just, it just it just makes sense to not have to waste time doing plate solves, you know, when it's dark, when you could be doing it when it's, you know, did, you know, twilight, you know, just the sun's. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah. you can, you can practically do start pl uh, building a model an hour before, maybe, maybe half even... hour before, uh, you know, where we really want to start imaging and that's just wasted time anyway. So just run a model. That's right. Uh, Guys, I, I agree with that, but practically speaking, we don't run that many plate solves in the course of a night anyway. Once we're on target, we generally stay on that target. Um, so it's not like we're plate solving all night, you know. Yeah, okay. but there are, That's true. There are I, two uses for uh, modeling, right? The one is to point and the other one is to track. <laughs> the track is going to work all night. Well, yeah, the the pointing might be one time. Right. Ray, does, can you update a model? Like if you were to generate a model on a, a night with a boat, you sort of avoided that area because it's too bright and you had a lot of failures. Could you go back another time and redo that part? Well, that that's a feature that's been asked by a few people. And technically, there's it's not built into the application to do that. But you could actually take points as long as you and on different nights set your, you know, that that very first point that Toga was asking about that you know, the zenith, as long as that is the same between them, that's the reference point. See, if you change that, then the numbers won't match, or then they won't on the model won't uh, mesh properly between different um, nights. But as long as you do that first one there, you can actually mix. Add, add those points in from another night, but you have to do it by hand. You can't, there's not a tool to do that right now. And APPM doesn't, hasn't been extended yet to, to do that feature, but it is possible. Okay, how are we doing on questions and from YouTube? Um, and uh, I don't think that we've got anything coming in from, um, um, yeah, we don't have anything new from Rumble Talk. I'm going to ask Ray a question that is not about APCC, but it okay. is about, um, an event we have coming up in the very near future. Um, and one of the things I got an I got an email today from uh, one of our club members asking me about having a show on AIC, and I just want to point out that um, AIC and TAIC are two different operations, completely different operations. AIC is the Advanced Imaging Conference, and that's been going on for years. And TAIC, the, the Astro Imaging Channel, well, now it's also been going on for years, but it's a completely different operation. But that's what I want to ask Ray about. Hey, Ray, tell us about what your perspective on AIC is, uh, what you're going to be doing there, and stuff like that. Well, AIC, I've actually gone to about, I think, maybe 10 of them now, maybe more than that, um, however many there has been, minus one, just one year I missed. And it's a great opportunity for you to meet up with uh, a lot of other imagers with, which have the same kind of uh, interest as you do. And it's just fun to be able to talk with, um, you know, with, with people right then and there about uh, all kinds of cool things. And if you hear something interesting going on about that somebody was working on some project, you can talk to them about it. And it just gives you ideas and you afterwards you're, you're energized to do more fun things that you never thought you would have, you know, you didn't think about beforehand. So do you have to be an advanced amateur to go there? No, not at all. In fact, if you're not an advanced amateur, you're going to gain more, I think, than if you are. I mean, there is, that's not to say that you won't learn something, but just that there are a lot of uh, people there who are 
who are in all stages from beginners to experts. And so you, you'll be able to ask them questions and it's much easier to ask them questions there than on cloudy nights or, um, you know, on, uh, you know, some forum someplace where you just get a short answer and it's, it's just easier to be able to talk and, and, you know, look at different telescopes, all the vendors are going to be there with all the equipment and, you know, you, you can look at what all the new toys that are coming out. And um, so it'd be, it'll be interesting. Cool. I think. Um, uh, Eric and Terry and Tolga, do we have any other questions coming in from the various places? By the way, Ray, you're still sharing your screen if you want to come back oh. to your little face. That'd be cool, too. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. It's no big deal. I just, we, I, I, I can see that you're, you're tweaking that image back and forth. A little oh, bit. sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Um, any other questions, guys? I want to remind you that next week, at 9 30 eastern 6 30 pacific lloyd smith will be taking us out to deep sky west and we'll have a good time looking at all this cool stuff that happens out there and then a week after that we're going to hear from some of the developers of um, nina who will be telling us about their um uh, astro imaging package it's a really it's a crowdsource type of thing where everybody's contributing to it. It's making a lot of strides. And uh, so we want to hear some more about that. And if I'm not mistaken, that should pretty much do it for the evening, eh? Has everybody got... Um, everybody yeah, ready? we don't have any more questions. We keep, uh, I okay. think we're all set. We'll see you all next week and take us out, Tolga. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Good night. Good night. Oh, don't forget to... Again. Subscribe and hit the bell button. Yep. We need subscribers. <laughs>